All right. Well, I have that we are at the top of the hour and we have a lot to get through today. So I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. Welcome, everybody. If you want to put where you're um, at today physically, what the weather's like, we'd love to hear from you. It's always fun to see people from all over. And we saw that there were several registrants from across the world. So we'd love to know what's happening where you're at. Thank you so much to our partner, Honor Lock. And I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Megan Raymond with WCET, and I coordinate our events, sponsorship, membership, and programs here at WCET. So as we go through today, feel free to follow the slides. We have several PowerPoints with definitions, and we won't spend time reading those full definitions, but I think you'll want to have them handy. We know this is gonna be a robust robust conversation. So if you have questions, enter them into the Q&A and we're gonna hold plenty of time for Q&A. If you have comments, links, resources, or chatter, go ahead and include that in the chat portion of the Zoom box so that we don't lose your questions in the chat box and your chat in the question box. If you'd like to follow along on Twitter, AKA X, the hashtag is WCET webcast. And again, we'll follow up with a link to the recording, the slides, and any resources that were shared early next week. Without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's moderator, a good friend of WCET's. Gloria Niles is the Director of Online Learning with the University of Hawaii System, and she's also actively involved in our work group on AI. Please welcome Gloria. Thank you, Megan. Uh, happy to be here and uh, excited for this conversation today. And I want to go ahead and have our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Jordan Adair. Thanks, Gloria. Yeah, I'm Jordan. I head up the product team at Honorlock. I've been in ed tech for about uh, eight or nine years now. And then prior to that, I was a teacher. I taught uh, elementary school for a few years and then middle school civics for a few years following that. So happy to be here, excited for the conversation. Thank you, Jordan. And Camilla Roberts. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Camilla Roberts. My full-time position is with as the director of the Honor and Integrity System at Kansas State University. So I manage all education and adjudication for the university. Um, as a side gig, I am also the president, current president of the International Center for Academic Integrity. Um, we're an international association of like-minded individuals, um, predominantly higher education. However, we do have some high school as well thrown in there of individuals who are interested in the discussion and research of academic integrity. Um, my background uh, is out of student life and student development. And so um, that's where a lot of my mindset's coming from with looking at how academic integrity relates to our students um, and student development, knowing that our students, are their minds are not fully formed when we first get them um, as an incoming freshman. And, and so seeing that connection um, has been very beneficial, at least in, in what I think of looking at academic integrity, and I'm sure we'll we'll be able to discuss that some more today. Thank you, Camilla. And Judith Sebesta. Thank you, Gloria. Howdy, everyone. I'm Judith Sebesta, founder and principal of Sebesta Education Consulting. I'm based in Austin, Texas, and I'm pleased to see a number of fellow Texans here, including Marianne and Carrie from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Glad to see all y'all here and everybody else. Um, I've been working with WCET to develop a number of resources and initiatives on AI as well as open education and open pedagogy. These are two areas of my expertise. And I just wanted to say I'm so grateful for this partnership with WCET and for the opportunity to participate on this panel. Thank you. Well, thank you to all three, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from each of you. Uh, so we'll go through very quickly uh, the definitions that Megan uh, referred to. And again, you'll receive a copy of these slides, so you'll be able to refer back to them. Uh, so academic integrity, uh, this is from Honor Locke's blog, uh, just defining it's a code of ethics for students. and um, so that we're all on the same page and understand what we're referring to when we talk about academic integrity. Okay, next slide. 
And artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a large umbrella term of which generative AI, which has become uh, the big topic of conversation, uh, is one form of artificial intelligence. So it's important to understand uh, that we're talking about a larger umbrella term when we refer to artificial intelligence. Next slide. So generative AI, as I mentioned, is uh, became a very popular term uh, starting last November when uh, ChatGPT became publicly available with its 3.5 version. And so this is the ability uh, for artificial intelligence to generate things, text, photos, um, code. Uh, so that's uh, a lot of where our conversation will be focused today is around generative AI. And then large language models. It's important to understand how generative AI works and it works through large language models. So when we're referring to large language models, that's what we're referring to is how generative AI uh, does, its, does its work. Okay, and we'll come to uh, this template in just a bit. But first I wanted to start with uh, our first question um, is to, can we just describe what the importance of academic integrity uh, in this AI and generative text world is? Uh, how, how is that impacting academic integrity? Let's start with Judith. Thank you, Gloria, because I can speak to this um, from a, a rather broad national perspective uh, based on a survey that I conducted this spring with Dr. Van Davis, who serves as the Chief Strategy Officer of WCET. And this was a survey of institutions of higher education on their practices and policies around AI. WCE subsequently published the report supporting instruction and learning through artificial intelligence. And the definitions that Gloria referenced are in that report. And I'm dropping the link to that here in the chat so that you can have that report. But if you also um, have the slides, you'll see you have a link to the slides, you'll see that um, that's also linked in those slides. We had 648 respondents to this survey last spring. And I just wanted to highlight a few of the key findings that are most pertinent to the subject of this webinar today. Concerns about AI and academic integrity, in other words, preventing cheating from the perspective of many of our respondents are a focus for many institutions and the top reason for not using AI. 26% of institutions cited that as the top reason they weren't using AI, fears of cheating. Now, at the same time though, the highest percentage of existing planned or considered use for detecting, it is for detecting AI generated content and plagiarism. That's 56% of the institutions that reported doing that. And additionally, just one more key finding that we had uh, relevant to this uh, uh, webcast is that those who have implemented policy, of those who have implemented policy, most unsurprisingly are doing so around academic integrity. And I believe we're going to talk about policy a little bit more here today. And that was 21% of those institutions that said that they were either have implemented or are planning policies around academic integrity. Uh, by the way, Van and I have subsequently developed an AI education policy and practice ecosystem framework that we're going to be disseminating after the WCET annual meeting. And it identifies three primary policy areas for AI. We're also developing and accompanying AI policies and practices toolkit that also considers the ethics of AI and elaborates on those policy areas. And that toolkit is going to be available to WCET members only. So make sure you have your membership up to date or become a member if you're not already. <laughs> That's Gloria, back to, back to you and to our, our other panelists to elaborate on sure. this. Well, thank you. We'll look forward to those resources coming out after the annual meeting. Um, and yeah, so I would imagine that academic integrity is uh, probably still high on the priority list, even since that, uh, that poll was done, uh, the survey. Uh, so let's go to Jordan next. Um, your thoughts on the importance of academic integrity in the AI and generative text world? Well, I certainly think it's important, but I also think that right now we 
are far away from understanding the real impact of AI on academic integrity. There's a lot of theories, I think, and a lot of concerns around how AI might be able to be used in a um, nefarious way or a, a way to cheat. And those may be justified, but right now I think there's uh, a lot of hypotheticals and not a lot of data yet to really show us what are students really doing um, and how effective are some of the policies and the tools that institutions may be utilizing to combat AI if that's the path that they're taking. Um, but I think really the question to be answered is how, we don't really understand the world of assessment yet with AI as a part of it. And so that's hard to lay out the landscape for how academic integrity is going to tie into that, right? If we've yet to really define how are we going to deliver an exam to our students leveraging AI, we can't yet define how we're going to keep those exams protected and safe and make sure that the work is being done honestly. So there's a lot of discovery to be had here, which is exciting because it's a, right on the cusp of a brand new technology that I think is going to really change education. So um, obviously, from my perspective at Honorlock, we're adjusting and adapting consistently and, or constantly, I should say, with kind of the changing trends and the thoughts around AI. And we'll have a lot of exciting stuff and work to do in the future, I'm sure. Well, that's a, a, an interesting perspective and thought of uh, defining assessments in the, this world of AI. Um, definitely an important uh, component. Uh, Camilla, your thoughts on the importance of academic integrity in the AI and generative text world? I think a lot of what I am thinking uh, really piggybacks onto what Jordan was just saying is that, um, of course, a year ago, I was contacted by so many professors saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We've got to do something like this is coming out. And it's like, OK, it's just one more thing. It's it's. We don't need to stop the world. We don't need to create complete bans across the entire universities. It's it's very similar to, I mean, our students were, were to a certain degree doing the same thing when they're able to buy a paper online. It almost didn't take, took a little bit longer. You purchase a paper, you can pay for expedited shipping, expedited for delivery for couple hours worth of work versus the generative AI is is very quick and and a quick response but still the some of our students might be doing the same thing so this is just a new way for them to be doing the same information and so when I talk with my faculty members at, at Kansas State in particular it's looking at the idea that if you're gonna if a student's going to be submitting something that they didn't create well, that still can be considered plagiarism. They did not create it. So we're not changing our policies in terms of what of the overarching policy of what a student can be held accountable for. Um, but I think like as Jordan said, there's so many things that we don't know. Um, and, and AI is just going to get better. <laughs> um, and so we think that, that, oh my goodness, and there's so much that's going on right now, but next year is gonna look completely different. I mean, mm -hmm. AI, it, this wasn't new. This was, I believe I've seen the chat GPT once I think there was like four or five different uh, kind of formats of it before it became really popular. And so it's just going to continue to change and adapt. And we just have to be able to continue to uh, adapt and change that change along with it. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting. And I would agree with Jordan about the idea of the assessments when we, when we hit March of 2020 and COVID, that was the big discussion of we well, can't just change your assessments from the on person in person classes to online. And so really looking at what is how do our assessments need to be uh, changed? And I think that's where even in academic integrity, we've started focusing on looking at those low stake assessments, looking at scaffolding of assignments. Um, and so the same things of looking at how do we ensure that our students are learning what we want them to learn and, and showing proficiency in the subject that we're trying to teach them, that crosses all the bounds. Um, it's not just, oh, is it online class? Is it a face-to-face -face class? If we're able to have those students show that proficiency, well, maybe that's with AI, maybe it's not with AI, and we have to figure that figure that out. And, and like Jordan said, there's a lot to be known and a lot to be learned still um, to figure that out. Uh, that, thank you, Camila. That you brought up some important points that uh, 
there have always been ways that students uh, can find uh, to be dishonest in, in uh, creating their own work. Um, it's not new, it's just a different way. Um, and really brings us uh, into our next question of uh, what type of, because I know there's been a lot of discussion about detect, detection tools and there's a lot of concerns around those, uh, but uh, what are practical tools and strategies to promote academic integrity? Let's start with you, Jordan. Yeah, so first, um, I think defining your expectations for your students is the most important element of that. Uh, we might assume that a lot of students know a lot more than we do about chat GPT and generative AI and um, that's not necessarily the case. This is new for everyone and not every student is, uh, you know, on the cutting edge of technology. So explaining to them what the tool is, when using it is acceptable in your class in, or in your set of courses, when using it is not acceptable. I know that seems very basic, but most students really are showing up to the exams to take their exam. They're not looking to cheat. Um, so if you can be upfront with them around your expectations, that goes a long way. And then if you have, you know, concerns and you want to put some deterrence into place, there are a variety of tools available. Obviously, um, partial coming from Honor Lock from the proctoring perspective, there are things you can do to lock down your exam and prevent students from getting outside of that test and getting to ChatGPT or using a secondary device. Um, using chat GPT or AI related extensions. Those are all things that can be bundled into perhaps a, a proctoring solution. But um, we've taken the approach that if, if you want to block AI use on an assessment, which is not always the right thing, I wanna be very clear. I think there is absolutely a place for AI in the assessment process, but there are times where you may wanna block, block its use. We've taken the approach that blocking is much more effective than detecting after the fact. We've run a bunch of experiments uh, feeding different prompts with different tweaks into these AI detection tools, and we've seen wild inconsistencies. And I think that uh, that's what a lot of educators are struggling with, is that if they're using these detection tools after the fact, but the results are not trustworthy, you can't take action on that result. If you get a report that, you know, it's 95% sure that this was AI generated, but you don't trust that result, what's the point of doing the detection in the first place, right? There's false positives, there's all kinds of concerns. So um, I think that, you know, you figuring out how to incorporate AI into your assessment in a healthy way with clear cut instructions and expectations is the most important piece. And then having a good preventative tool in place when you want to block it. Yeah, th those clear expectations are so important uh, in having those conversations. Camilla, uh, let's go to you next as far as uh, practical tools and strategies. How do you promote academic integrity? Well, I think the thing that, that we hear most about is, oh, we need detection. In fact, I replied probably to two different emails yesterday of what what is what do we have? What license do we have for detection? And I'm like, there's not. There's actually been some research that um, is in publication from the European Network for Academic Integrity, um, or really ran at first, but some colleagues in both Mexico and Sweden, um, that they looked at a variety of these detection tools. And what Jordan was saying, they're finding a lot of false negatives and false positives. And, and it's, we don't want to we don't want to use those false negatives or false positives and come to our students saying we think you didn't write this paper when we're when we are seeing that the research is showing that these detection tools are are not able to accurately detect human writing versus um, AI generated writing and then this research what the research did is they not only took just straight AI generated writing but then they took maybe some AI generated writing and used used some bots to change some words and they would adapt some of them then they also changed it to different languages so a non native english speaker and all of those whenever they added any component the percentage of actually finding the AI generated text went down and so we're seeing that those detection services just aren't what they're 
they they probably should not be used, I guess. I guess is the short short answer because it's not going to be able to help our students. So it's not going to be able to help us. Um, so I think it is integrating the artificial intelligence and using it as part of the assessments. Um, and it's it's out there. It's our students have so many devices. So if you say, oh, I'm not going to let you do it on this one device. Well, they're going to do it on a different device. And so I think it's important that we truly do incorporate it into our assessments. Um, and, and there's a variety of ways to, to do that, whether it's having um, it be a learning experience to learn about a student's voice, to be able to see, and it could be a, a real in education and diversity as well, to see that listen, this voice that comes out of these generative uh, large language models are, is the voice of traditionally a, a North American white male. And to be able to understand that each one of our students has a different voice. And what does that mean? And so that in and of itself is a learning experience for the student. Um, I come from a land grant institution. And so our our main goal is to educate our students to become good citizens of our, of our state, of our nation, of our country. And so that's how I try to put it forward to our faculty members that, okay, you might not be able to, um, they might not like biology all the time. They might not like math all the time, but we can teach them life skills and how do they determine one, the information that's being provided by this AI, is it even true? How can they how can they show that that's factual information? So maybe that's the assessment that have AI write this paper on this whatever topic, and then those students have to go and, and look at it and prove those points. Maybe go and find those resources. Are those resources even the references? Are they valid references? So being able to think about ways to change it and and incorporating it, I think, is going to definitely be the key because there's. There's not going to be a way that we catch students in doing it. Um, it's helping them understand, again, and we'll talk about this, I know, later on, the idea of creating that culture of, a of integrity of how do we realize and help our students realize that why does integrity even matter? Why are we pushing this? And why does it matter that I'm not doing my own work or I am doing my own work? Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, well, lots, of, lots of nuggets there that are really important. Um, one, you, you touch on the uh, many of the concerns, particularly the bias uh, it, that could impact detection tools. Um, and, you know, really the, the deeper question is how do we teach our students to be good citizens? Because they're gonna have to make these decisions when they get into the workforce too. They're gonna, they're going to be in the workforce with AI and they're gonna have to make integrity decisions. Uh, so it's best to to approach it from from that perspective. Great yeah, point. I'll, I'll add that one thing when you're talking about that. That's again that student development perspective. But it's I had a, a colleague say yesterday or last week that this time in their life it's like they're in a learning lab for ethical decisions. And yes. right now it's a safe place to make some of those poor choices. It's not a safe place necessarily. You could lose licenses. People's lives could yeah. be at stake, whatever it might be when they're in that workforce. And so now's the time for us to be able to help them learn. Good point. Uh, Judith, uh, and any insights into what these uh, forthcoming resources might have as far as practical tools and strategies to promote academic integrity? Not, not specifically pointing to those. Um, I mean, yeah. as I'm doing my research related to those, I have uh -huh a kind of list of some tips and strategies uh, that I thought I'd share. And uh, you'll see that some of them are reflective of what both Jordan and Camilla have already shared. You know, I, I did want to mention that if you're not familiar with Ethan Mollick's One Useful Thing, it's a great resource. It's a sub stack with all kinds of good information. I'm putting the link into the chat. And I love his statement, quote, it is not surprising that so many people are trying to stop AI from being weird. So I under I understand that, yeah. but I, 
that we really can, AI can be our ally in our instruction. And yes. the, these, this kind of list of tips that I've compiled from a variety of sources, and some of them are mine having been in the classroom, um, scaffolding learning, which has already been mentioned at this time to include discussion of and practice on AI tools relevant to that discipline. Think about how the use of AI can improve your learning outcomes. I can't say that enough. Design assignments to support intrinsic motivation. motivation. It's always worth underscoring the, that um, clarifying the purpose of each assignment and introducing student choice or personal connection can help diminish dishonesty and make it less likely. Provide clear steps in the assignment process and require students to be transparent about completing those steps. Of course, that's just good pedagogy, but that can be very effective in helping to alleviate and mitigate um, uh, academic dishonesty when it comes to AI. Test your assignments on la large language models like ChatGPT. Um, so you know, there's just a variety of, of strategies we can go about. What I would argue can be problematic strategies are these three, banning the use of AI, trying to game AI by creating assignments it can't complete, chances are it's going to win. <laughs> and limiting assignments to in-class only. You're not doing your students any favor if you're limiting your assignments now to only being in class. There could be exceptions to that depending on the, thank you, Annette, depending on the discipline. But um, again, you know, I can't, I can't reiterate. It, if it can support your learning outcomes, see it as an ally. I, uh, the last thing I wanted to mention before we move on, Gloria, is this quote from eCampus News. This is Roger James Hamilton, who is the founder and CEO of the Genius Group. I'll put a link into this article, but he says, the fusion of AI and education stands as a beacon of promise for the future. By tailoring learning experiences, cultivating critical thinking, and democratizing access AI-based learning acts as a fertile ground for nurturing the entrepreneurs of tomorrow. I found that very inspiring. So I'll put that link in the chat. Gloria, back to you. Yeah, those, those are important points. Uh, really, that the, speaking to those authentic assessments and when students really know the, the why, why do I need to learn this? Why do I need to do this? That becomes the intrinsic motivation. And those three things not to do are really key as well, because uh, you know the, the common quote I read almost every day is that AI is the worst it's gonna be right now. Uh, it's continually evolving. So if you try to uh, you know, AI proof your assignments, next week there's gonna be a new iteration that will make undo all that work that you did to try and AI proof it. Uh, so thank you for those tips and strategies. So uh, let's move on to policy statements now. Uh, what are some examples of artificial intelligence honesty policy statements? Let's start with you, Camilla. As I mentioned, I, I don't think that there's many universities that have had good success if they've chosen to do a complete ban on artificial intelligence. Um, I mean, just as Judith would just said, that's one of the one of the three things. You can't just ban it completely. Um, I think it is very much, I've seen different ways that professors have put it into their syllabi or into each um into each as uh assignment guidelines. So you can make sure that this professor is being very clear of what you can or cannot do. I'm gonna um drop a link into the chat. This is actually a, a Google document that anybody can actually add to. Um, so it's almost like a wiki that of, of what professors have been able to put on there of what is what they're using. Um, and so in most of this, most of the cases on this in this document, you're going to see what the teacher is teaching, what they're saying, and then also a lot of them give their contact information. So it's a great way to be able to connect with other professors. But I really like one of them that um, I'm just going to read you a little bit of it, but this uh, individual from actually Wharton School of uh, from the University of Pennsylvania in specialization of for insects, he says, I expect you to use AI in this class. In fact, some assignments will require it. And this is an important thing. Learning to use AI is an emerging skill. And I provide tutorials in Canvas about how to use them. And I'm happy to meet and help you with these tools and so on. But then he also says, be aware of the limits of ChatGPT. If you provide minimum effort prompts, then you'll get low quality results. 
You'll need to refine your prompts in order to get the good outcomes. This will take work. Don't trust anything it says. It'll give you a number or a fact. Assume it's wrong unless you either know the answer or can check it with another source. Then it goes on and says some more AI is a tool, but one you need to acknowledge using. So he asked for a paragraph at the end. So that is one way that I think that the professors are being very upfront. Um, I mean, we've talked about that students don't know everything at this point in time. And so it's very important that we're giving that information. Now, yes, you'll also see in this document some saying, for any time AI is, is used, I'm going to report it to our an honor and integrity system or whatever it might be called. So you're going to see a variety of responses within this document, but I think it was it's been very beneficial for a lot of faculty to read these and see the wide scope, but then also to see like, oh, wow, this is still my responsibility to teach our students and, and help them understand. And I love how I, I would love to actually contact this professor and see what are those tutorials that he's using on how to student, how students should use AI. And so hopefully I'm not going to have everybody on this uh, webinar contacting him <laughs> today. I do not know him. It was just kind of a rant. I was like, oh, I really like that. Um, but I think that's those are the kind of examples that we're going to need to be looking at of how do we incorporate it and not necessarily a policy statement of, yes, you can absolutely do this. No, you cannot do this. Um, I've also seen, and it, I think it could easily be done with, with AI, of something that looks more like a, a stoplight. Like, when can you absolutely not do it? They, you should not just put it in and submit it as your own writing. I think most people could agree that if you don't do anything with it, you don't make any changes, you just put the prompt, that's wrong. Yellow light, well, if you make a few changes, is that okay? Green light might be that I'm able to brainstorm a topic or, listen, I wrote the whole paper, but I can't think of a catchy title. Maybe that's okay to do. Put in the, put in the thing and say, hey, I need to have a title. Or... ChatGPT is very good for, as a side note, for personal reasons. It planned our vacation last year. It was able to develop a plan for, I'm going to start in Kansas and I want to go west and I want to see this, this, and this, and it planned our route for us. And so we can see that red light, yellow light, green light, and that's that visual for those students. So it's not necessarily a policy, it's more guidelines and helpful tips. Yeah, uh, that curation of, of policies is has been really helpful for a lot of people to just see the wide variety of different approaches uh, to AI. But uh, the one that really uh, caught my ear as you were reading them was uh, the one that is really teaching students that if they're using it, they are also responsible for the content that it's generating. And so uh, they need to be able to learn to, to fact check, understanding how a large language model works, that it's just predicting the next word. Uh, and sometimes like humans, that prediction is off and it sends them in a different direction than you expected it to go. Um, so that's a really key point. Um, so Judith, uh, what are your thoughts on policies? Well, as you can imagine in the toolkit that we've got coming out, we have provided some examples. Um, and, and I think one or two may come from that document, Camilla, that you referenced. Um, but we've, you know, we've looked through them, we've vetted them. And there's one, if, if there's someone here from University of Delaware, kudos to you, because we do give a shout out to University of Delaware's policy, which seems kind of representative of the types of approaches that institutions are engaging in with their policy related to academic integrity. I'll drop the link to this in the chat in just a minute. But they have kind of four ranges of use um, that they, that they um, uh, address with their policy. Number one, prohibit all use of these tools. And then they talk about that. Number two, allow their use only with prior permission. Allow their use only with explicit acknowledgement or attribution or freely allow their use. And then they have information about each of those. And that kind of range tends to be fairly representative of what institutions are doing in their policy. So I'm gonna drop that link in the chat. So just, you know, stay tuned that I, I put also put some uh, verbiage from our toolkit regarding that kind of range of policies that folks are engaging in. Great, uh, look forward to seeing this. And Jordan, uh, how about your thoughts on these, uh, AI honesty policies. Yeah, back to your slide so, here. So I think in addition to what Judith and Camilla mentioned, one element of uh, an AI policy statement that's important to consider is 
a policy for faculty and professors as well coming from the institution. Because there are a lot of educators that I've talked with about AI who want to use it as a tool for themselves as well, but are unclear or unsure about when is that okay? When should I not use it? What type of information can I feed into it? What should I protect because of privacy concerns and things of that nature? So um, I haven't seen a great example of a policy that includes best practices for professors and faculty, but I think that's something to consider as you're looking to develop one at your institution. Um, also kind of piggybacking on what Camilla mentioned, no matter what you put in your policy, there, unless it's just flat out prohibit AI, which I think we're all kind of in agreement is not the, the way to go. Um, you're going to need to teach your students how to use it a little bit. And a couple of interesting ways I've seen um, instructors go about doing that. I've seen assignments where the prompt itself, so as you give the student uh, an essay, you are setting the expectation that they're going to use ChatGPT or some other uh, generative AI model, but you're not going to grade the outcome, you're going to grade their prompts. So what they're feeding in to ChatGPT is what they're then going to essentially copy and paste into their essay response, and that's what you're going to grade as the professor. So you're teaching them how to craft those better prompts, how to pull out additional information, how to tweak the responses that you're getting back from ChatGPT. Another interesting one is debating against ChatGPT. Give the student a topic, let them debate for some set number of rounds with ChatGPT, and then submit that transcript as something that can be graded. So those are just a couple I wanted to throw out there. So I saw a question come through the chat related to that earlier. But um, up on the slide here, you can kind of see some key bullets that you can hit, uh, many of which have been touched on by Judith and Camilla. But uh, it really comes down to do something with your policy. <laughs> it doesn't need to be perfect, but students are craving a direction and clarity. So if you can tell them what the expectations are, that goes such a long way, even if the policy itself is not the most perfect thing. Yeah, uh, it's important to start somewhere. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, so I think this last question, it has been the underlying theme of, of our discussion so far, and it's about creating a culture of academic integrity in your institution. And Camille, I wanted to start with you, as you mentioned that we're you know, creating this learning lab of uh, for students to learn how to be ethical citizens in their community and in their future careers. Yeah, and I'm going to bring this back to a little bit more of um, the point of view of how do we look at uh, how do we look at our students and look at the idea that we're creating them to be again those good as citizens and creating the integrity that's going to go beyond um, the classroom. And I am, and I did realize that I was dropping the, the wiki link into the wrong thing. And so I'll, I will correct that before I uh, send in this link. Um, the link that I've just dropped into the, the chat is from the International Center for Academic Integrity, which are the fundamental values. And you can download a free copy of this, but I think this is where we really need to focus on looking at an overarching creation of a, a, of a culture of integrity of, of bringing these values back um, that we have six different values, honesty, trust, fairness, respect, responsibility, and courage. And if we look at all six of those values and, and it's very easy to say, oh, these are really simple words, but if you really start to dive into them of what, is it, what does honesty mean from a faculty member's perspective? What does honesty mean from a student's perspective? But then, Going beyond that and in the classroom, us being as, as faculty and staff being able to talk to our students, okay, what does honesty mean when, um, when it's in the corporate world? We can give examples probably of all of these when our when corporations have failed to have part of these values. I mean, the with honesty, we think back to the Volkswagen um, emission scandal and they were lying about the amount of um, uh, amount of emissions that were being produced by their cars. Well, what happened when the truth came out? 
their reputation was hurt. Um, we think about how uh, we want our we want our our businesses and corporations to have transparency. So they're taking responsibility and they're telling us about what uh, what's actually going on. How are they making progress? Um, and they're also taking responsibility with making sure that they're treating people fairly, that they are um, paying the the right wages for individuals. So there's a lot of a lot of things beyond the idea of academic integrity. And that's why I, I, I've stressed that already, but I will continue to stress it that it's that their four, five, six years in college, um, we really want them to figure out that there is that bigger picture. Um, and, and the idea of courage is the idea that courage was actually a sixth value that was added after the fact. We had five fundamental values for quite a while and we added the sixth because to actually live out those other values, you had to have courage. And, and I think example of, of Nike, when, um, when Lance Armstrong had his Live Strong campaigns, but then we found out that Lance Armstrong might have been taking some performance enhancing drugs and was kind of falsifying that. Nike had the option. They knew that there was a lot of money to be had being a partner with Lance Armstrong, being a partner with this Live Strong Foundation. But they had to have courage to be able to say, you know, it's not worth it because we want to maintain the integrity of our of our corporation or in of our company. Um, and so sometimes we have to think about what is that courage on a university campus? What does that look like? What is does it look like to stand up for what is right? To stand up maybe as a as a student, to stand up to a fellow peer and say, listen, we we've got a we've got a problem here. Um, you said you were going to do this in this group assignment and I haven't seen anything being done or you said you were going to do it and this doesn't seem like your work. Can you help me? Because we're putting our both of our names on this paper. And so they're having to have that courage to be able to stand up and and creating that culture of integrity is really, truly based on these six fundamental values um, that have to be started from the classroom. It can't just be something from a top down. It can't just be your president of your institution saying this institution is going to have integrity. It is truly from all, everyone involved has to be a part of that. And it has to be continual conversations and figuring out how what every decision we make somehow fits into these fundamental values. Yeah, that, that's really important. And what a great add of courage uh, to those fundamental values. Um, uh, Jordan, let's go on to you as far as creating a culture of academic integrity. Well, I think that we've touched on a lot of the the clear communication aspect of that, and that goes a long way. The other thing that I would encourage everyone to just remember is students, you know, the the bad egg kind of gets focused on more than the honest student. But uh, in our world, we see a ton of data and a ton of information around what students are really trying to do when they go to take their test. And they're, they're trying to take their test to the best of their ability. They're not showing up with the intention to cheat, right? It's the very small minority that we need to be worried about if we're trying to prevent academic dishonesty. Um, so I just would encourage, don't allow some of the concerns for that minority to kind of taint the um, relationship of trust between a professor mm -hmm. and a student. Because what I've seen is when that happens, it creates just a self-fulfilling cycle of if as a professor, you inherently don't trust your entire class, it almost leads to more attempts to cheat because now you're, you're, you're creating a sense of distrust. It, it even puts the thought into students' minds, well, man, if my professor thinks that we're cheating, there must be a lot of people in this class that are cheating. I might need to, to keep up, you know? Um, and, and the reality is that's just not the case. It is the small minority. So definitely come into it with a sense of trust. I don't mean that to say, don't, don't put any preventative measures in place. Just, you know, I, I'm not implying that. But uh, you want to have that healthy relationship so the student feels trusted. And that seems to really be one of the most effective ways. And it also helps, I think, to Camilla's point, where when there is that sense of trust, people feel a little more courage to speak up when things are out of line. When there's not a, when it's not coming from an origination of trust, as a student, I don't really feel comfortable speaking up about what's going on if I don't have that trust relationship with my professor or classmates. 
Yeah, that's that is so crucial. That foundation uh, of a trusting relationship uh, is really critical, and I it's been my experience as well. And uh, that when there is a, a sense of distrust, uh, that it permeates the class. Um, so yeah, uh, developing that, that relationship that with a foundation of trust, um, also shows, you know, creates a, a caring relationship too, uh, with your students. Um, Judith, your thoughts. Laura, I don't have a lot to add after Camilla and Jordan's brilliant points. And I know we want to get to our attendees' questions, but just two things I want to add. They might seem tangential, but I would argue they must infuse everything we do related to AI, including academic integrity. Number one is equity. We must ensure equitable access to these technologies, or we're just creating a new digital divide. We have to make sure that we're not creating a disparity in learning opportunity and skill development. And the second thing I just wanted to mention is that this is a, this is really an amazing opportunity to focus on what makes us human. And I think if we do that, then we can um, have that kind of mentality of, of, of the best defense is a good offense. Um, it, it's, it, we really need to focus on these qualities that humans have that I would argue robots and AI don't, although who knows how this is going to go in the future, but creativity, empathy our consciousness. Um, these are qualities that I think we can really focus on. And if we do, I think we're gonna be more ethical and effective in our use of these technologies. Those are two great key points uh, to lead us into our Q&A uh, session. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh... So let's see, we have a question. I teach upper division and graduate law classes online through D2L. The content is challenging for the undergrad classes. As a means of fostering student learning and success, I allow them to take graded assessments twice for the highest score. Recently, students have been sending me screenshots of exam questions. Also this semester, students have been posting grades of 90 plus on their first attempt. I find this suspicion. Suspicious, what are your thoughts? I don't mind taking a stab at that. So uh, first, if the student, if your students are sending you screenshots of the exam, you can rest assured that the, your content is all over the internet. Uh, interestingly, so from 2020 till today, um, we've seen an increase in the amount of content that's leaked online. It used to be about 12% of all exam items you could find online. Now it's over 36% that you can find. And that number seems to just continue to keep growing. So that problem of screenshotting and sharing things online is certainly one that you would likely want to prevent. Um, and when you see these unnatural bell curves in your course, it, it, it would be risky to automatically assume that that means something, but it certainly can be suspicious. Uh, and I can definitely speak from experience where we've come in to work with a variety of institutions because of that irregular bell curve. And when they've introduced some type of preventative measure like proctoring, they were able to see that curve normalize a bit more. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't want to put more fuel to your concern, but uh, it, it sounds like at the very least, the screenshot issue is something that a preventative tool, a preventative you know, online proctoring tool would be able to handle that issue for you. Thanks. Anything to add to that? Yeah. I would just add that when I have faculty members that say, I think this might be suspicious, especially when it's an entire class. I mean, this is a large, large class. You're not just targeting one student of saying, I think this is, having a conversation. I think there's a lot of fear of saying, oh, I'm going to start talking about academic integrity. I'm going to give them ideas. No, you're not giving our students ideas. They know what's out there just as much as we do. Some better, some maybe not quite as much, but they're going to realize and, and you talking about AI isn't going to be hopefully it's probably not their first introduction of AI. <laughs> and so so I would have a conversation with the class and be like, wow, y'all are doing a fantastic job. 
I want to make sure that you're actually retaining this information. And I want to make sure that I'm preparing you because, well, this was an upper level class, but let's say it's a biology 101. And I know the topic that we're going to be discussing now, you're going to need in your next level class. And so again, giving them reasons of that, having that intrinsic motivation of why do I need to learn this? Why, why is this really important? And so um, that's what having this would really open, I think, open the door for conversation to be had. Great. Uh, okay, we have another question uh, and it's taking a little bit of a different angle on the discussion. I feel this that using AI for assignments, submissions, et cetera, means that the user cannot verify the source, which uh, sources which are used. Does this not default to plagiarism by the user? If you cannot verify sources used, how can you cite the sources? In the professional world, failing to verify information or give credit to creators can cause real ramifications. So should educators encourage the use of AI or is it better to warn that quote unquote stealing intellectual content can have real consequences in the professional world. Thoughts? You know, I, I would argue that there are often, I, I couldn't say always, but are ways to verify that information. And if you're doing your due diligence, you should. Remember, a lot of these large language models are built on, programmed on data from the internet. So, you know, grabbing that, taking the time to grab what you've gotten out of ChatGPT or Claude or Bard or wherever, um, and, and putting it into Google and putting it into, into a search engine can get you quite a bit of information. And, you know, I, it, it, it takes time, it takes resources, but uh, if, if, if you're not doing that, then you're right. That is a problem, but it can be done. It, I, I think maybe not always, maybe not everywhere, maybe not with every tool, but I think it can be done and it should be done. And MLA, uh, Chicago manual, you know, all of your standard manuals for citation and attribution have some guides on this. I could probably find those links. Probably a lot of you have seen them, but I could grab those links real quick, probably. Mm -hmm. I think several of those have been put in the chat too. I saw um, some APA stuff, especially. But I would say, and following up on, on what Judith had to say, that if you can't verify it, then it, maybe it shouldn't even be put in there. Maybe it's, I mean, it's it's kind of like, well, is that really accurate information? If you're not able to verify it anywhere else that this is actually truth, then probably shouldn't be in the paper in the first place. Um, and and that is, that's part of that learning to work with AI of how do you verify what is coming out there is true, what is not. And and as as Jordan gave that example of, what prompts are you putting into that that AI? Well, that's teaching our students also that background research of how do I verify things are true or not? Um, I know most of us have talked, we were talking before the, the panel that we all have, have, a lot of us have children and that's part of the deal. They're growing up in the technology age and having a middle schooler is trying to make sure she understands that not everything on the internet is true. And how does she verify what is true and what is not? I mean, there's, for years, there have been many people who have English professors, history professors that say, you're not allowed, allowed to use Wikipedia as a valid source. And so it's that same idea of, well, you need to make sure you can verify that. And so you might find it first on Wikipedia, but you need to then go back to the primary source and figure out what is that, what was that primary source? What was the or original source? Yeah, fact checking and uh, verifying sources is a uh, is definitely a, a key uh, skill to teach uh, in living with academic integrity in the AI world. We have one last question that I want to end with before I uh, send this back to Megan, and it's how can we support students in the aftermath of an academic integrity violation? I'll pop in first with that since I do that on a daily basis. It seems like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the first thing, and is one word, is compassion. I think we have to lead with compassion, understanding that our students have maybe made a poor choice, whether that was a knowledgeable choice, whether they knew what they were doing was wrong or they had a misunderstanding, something happened, but realizing that doesn't make them a bad person. It makes it a learning opportunity for them. Um, Hopefully your institution has some sort of policy in place or a procedure for our students to have due process um, and to be able to, 
to learn from the experiences. Very few institutions now at this point have a one strike and you're out policy. They want them to, we want our students to be successful. We want them to remain on campus. Um, and so if you're a professor, one, you do need to follow the policies and procedures of your institution if you need to report something. But then those offices and yourself are making sure that you still teach them like you would teach any other student, that you realize that was a one-time mistake. And you, again, I think it was Jordan who was saying that you've got to trust your students from the get-go, that you trust that they're going to learn from that and not every other assignment for the future time in your class, they're all going to be um, academically misconduct or academically uh, dishonest. And so, but it, it all comes down to the idea of compassion and realizing that we are all people, we make mistakes, we're gonna learn from them. And again, this is their time to make those mistakes and help them learn. One quick note to you to support that. Uh, I think along the way, right, before they get to the point of something that might be a failable or potentially like an expulsion type situation, giving them feedback along the way of behaviors that you want to see corrected. The schools that I've seen with the healthiest academic integrity environments are those that have a really good feedback loop to the student, where if you, you know, student had one little issue in an exam that got reported, you just give the student the feedback right there. You don't have to take any further action yet. Nothing's gotten that severe. That often is enough to nip it in the bud and never even get to that escalated level later on. So definitely would encourage everyone to be participating in that feedback loop to their to their students. Jordan, that's so well said. You too, Camilla. And just quickly, this is an opportunity for us to help our students build skills that they are going to need in the workforce. Not probably will need, but are going to need. So if we can think of it in that, in, in kind of that spirit of opportunity, maybe that can help. Thank you. That was a, a great way to round out our discussion. Uh, Megan has put our the contact information for all of our panelists on the screen today. And now I want to thank each of you with, for this great discussion. And I want to turn it back to Megan. Thank you. And thank you, Gloria, Jordan, Camilla, and Judith. And thank you for the really engaging, interactive conversation that took place in the chat. Thank you for sharing all the resources. We are going to figure this out collectively and collaboratively. We did record this and we'll post it on our website. You can also access our previous webcasts on this channel. And um, we'll share out any resources. We'll pull together that extensive list of links and share that back out with you too. If this is your first WCET event, do check out our website. We are guided by the principles of community equity, policy, and practice. And we have some more exciting events coming up. We'll have a policy webinar for WCET and SAN members in November. And then our next webinar is on Accessibility Considerations in Open Education. That will be November 16th, and that is free and open to all. Just around the corner is our annual meeting in New Orleans. Registration is still open for that. And we are also holding our first in-person annual summit for women in e-learning in conjunction with the annual meeting. You can learn more via the bit.ly. Lastly, I'd like to thank our sponsors, especially HonorLock for helping us put on this webinar today and for their expertise and input and our WCET supporting members. So thank you to our participants, our supporting members, our members and our sponsors. Without you, we wouldn't be able to do, we wouldn't be able to do these kinds of events and programs. So again, thank you everybody and be well.